gentlemen, thank you for being here tonight. This is the third of four High Plains Underground Water Conservation District Rainwater Harvesting and Zurich Landscape Workshops. I'm Carmen McCain. I'm the District's Information Education Group Supervisor. This is Adeline Fox, who handles our outreach and education for the district. We're glad you're here to learn about rainwater harvesting and Zurich Landscape. For those of you who may not be familiar with the district, High Plains Underground Water Conservation District was created in September 1951 by area residents and the Texas Legislature. We are charged with conserving, preserving, protecting, and preventing waste of the underground water and aquifers within our service area. We cover all or part of 16 counties, ranging all the way from west of Amarillo to O'Donnell in Lynn County, to the Texas-New Mexico border, to Floyd and Crosby counties above the Caprock. So that's all or part of 16 counties. It's quite a bit of area. So we're going to tell you a little bit tonight about rainwater harvesting. It's something that we think is a good conservation tool. We'll also have another presentation for the second half of the workshop that talks a little bit about Zurich landscaping. So with that, I will turn it over to Adeline, and she'll tell you a little bit about the rainwater harvesting component. Adeline? Thank you. All right. Yes, we're glad to have you tonight. And I will get it kicked off here. By the way, if you all have any questions during um, the slideshow or anything, just wave me down and let me know. It's easier to kind of catch it while it's on the screen. Okay, so recharge, retain, and reusing rainwater. This is going to be a very general view of systems, system components, and system logistics. So we are just trying to kind of get the word out and get some knowledge out. Okay, let's see. I'm going to just not risk that. I'm going to go ahead and do this. I don't know if many of you ever feel like this, but um, it's... It's an easy feeling to have. drought but in this area we have fared pretty well in fact the mule shoe rainfall totals for 2013 through 2015 are listed here I can't believe this I did not realize this of course this rain gauge is southwest of town and so I'm sure not every part of mule shoe got that much rain but that was a pretty impressive number 20 inches we usually get about 18 in this area and then year to day we've had 2.7 not bad Tonight we'll cover, as I mentioned, just the basics, determining and selecting what kind of system you're interested in. What is going to work best for you and your home? Are you going to use it for livestock purposes? There are lots of things to consider. Also, we want to talk about cost and a few maintenance logistics that are pretty important in the long run. Okay, we know, obviously, rainwater harvesting is capturing rain runoff from some kind of surface. Uh, typically a roof, but there are even 
homemade uh, catchment systems in the middle of pastures. It doesn't necessarily have to be a roof from your home. We can divert it with different types of downspouts, and I'm going to get into that later in the program. Why is it worth it? People always laugh that we're having rainwater harvesting workshops and we don't get enough rain to make any difference. Well, we really do. It's, it's, it doesn't take too much to fill up something as simple as a 50-gallon rain barrel or even larger scale. This is a great formula to take into consideration if you're wanting to put in a system. You have to calculate your catchment area first. So if you have a roof that's a thousand square feet and you get one inch of rainfall, you have a conversion factor of 0.623, and that's, that's used um, nationally. I'm not sure how they came up with that. You can collect 623 gallons of water with just that kind of roof surface area. So I believe in the story of rainwater catchment. I think it's a good story to tell. But there are other incentives as well. So this formula is very helpful, and it's actually in the brochure um, back there. If you didn't catch it, uh, or write it down, uh, we'll make sure and get that to you afterwards. It is Texas sales tax exempt, and so it's just like an ag sales tax, um, except you've got rainwater harvesting equipment. We have uh, the obvious choice of purity and softness. Rainwater is typically pure and softer. Um, great for your hair, if you can catch it and shower with it, it's awesome. You also have a state that recognizes the importance of capturing rainwater. And so they have a statewide award called the Rain Catcher Award that you can have statewide recognition and it's a, a very nice achievement to earn. And obviously it's, it's also focused around conservation and that's something that we really push because we would rather have a supplemental use of the aquifer if we can. We, we try to kind of diversify just like our investments. I like to break this up into a few decisions to make. I think the first one should be what is your price range? Price range. That's kind of the beginning for any decision that we make, I feel like. Some price estimates relating to just the barrels are listed here. We've got 65 to 11,000 gallon poly tanks. The poly tanks are going to be your most popular option. Typically, they're most cost effective. And we have access to these around here. I know some people who got their tanks from Wiley Spray. So we have that kind of equipment around here because the farmers use it, which is really good. We can also have bar barrels that are smaller than this. This one here is 50 gallons. But you see that the price can escalate very quickly. If you are wanting to capture rain off of a very large barn surface, you're going to need one of these larger tanks. And so it will be an investment from, from every standpoint. This is just the barrel. So by the time you gutter it, by the time you, if you wanted a pump, a filter, anything like that, it's, it's going to add up very quickly. Your next decision, where do you want to put the system? If you have a large yard, maybe you have a little bit more flexibility. If you have a smaller yard, you might, might have to plan it out a little bit better. All right, so the roof area of the building, it does matter because you don't want to put a barrel that size on a, a stock barn. That's just not going to make a lot of sense, right? That's good for your home, that's good for maybe a small shed in your backyard, but that will not take care of a big livestock farm. So that's very important. Also, the material of your roof. So if you have shingles, um, that's okay if you're using it for outdoor use. If you wanted to use it indoors at any time, it would be better to have some kind of tin or metal roof because you're not catching all the shingle material um, and all the, all the chemicals that could be in that. So metal is best for domestic use. And then you want to know where your primary runoff area is. If you have a waterfall coming off of your back porch, that would be a perfect place to gutter and either direct it somewhere else, or if it's not in the way too much, you could actually put the barrel right there underneath the waterfall. I had a my house in Brownfield, I, I worked and lived there for a while before I came back to the High Plains Water District. And I had the same thing happen. The waterfall would come right off of my porch, but it wasn't really convenient to have a barrel right there. And I had very sandy soil, obviously, Terry County. And so with that, it would have not have made sense for me to have a barrel there. I should have guttered it and then taken it somewhere else, which that's the beauty of gutters. You have a little bit more control. And I said already the yard space allowance. 
So what did these look like? Let's look at some examples. This is not from around here, <laughs> if you guys couldn't tell. However, I like this example because we have a pump on top of the barrel, which is allowing him to have higher pressure. So if you did want to use a spray nozzle, I'd highly recommend having some kind of pump on the barrel or connected to the barrel. But you have something very aesthetic here. It's, it's got a maybe an overflow or maybe just a regular watering pipe there. And we have a rain chain here which is directing the water into the barrel. We'll get to that later as well. You can have very simple barrels. These are very popular. You can paint them, you can decorate them, make them your own. And uh, I'm not sure what their capacity is in this picture. But they have it behind their home. They've got a gutter in it. Very simple, low maintenance for the most part. And then this one, which is, it looks more like a, I don't know, like a compost container to me. But they've got it in their gutter, and um, they've got it, it looks like it's on their deck or their porch. Okay, decision number three. What kind do you need? So, I had no idea until I started working with the district that there were so many types of tanks. You need to figure out which one would be most fitting to you, again. We have systems, as I said earlier, that can range from 10 to 11,000 gallons. But poly tanks are the most cost effective, and you can make them your own. You can design them a little easier than some of the other options. There's fiberglass, which you can create into shapes. I've seen a turtle fiberglass tank before. It was huge. Corrugated steel, galvanized tin, and then you have concrete tanks, which some livestock producers have more of a concrete tank that they utilize. So here we have the examples. I really like the way the tin looks. I think it looks kind of cool. But the wood is probably my favorite. So the wooden panels, you can put those on any barrel. It doesn't matter what kind of barrel material you have. You can put the wood paneling on and it looks very nice. It blends in nicely with your, your yard. Here's an example of the concrete tank. And I don't know the capacity of that. It looks quite large. But you could use that um, for your livestock if you wanted to. Okay, I realize some of the pictures don't have the barrel elevated, but that is bad. I don't know, I need to get those out of there, I guess. So you have to elevate your rain barrel. It's a must, must, must. And that's why I've got this on a, I don't know, two to three foot container to show that it needs to be elevated for sure. You also need a very fine screen, and these are equipped with screens, so you don't have to go out and buy another one unless you just really want to. Because you don't want a lot of critters in there, you don't want leaves, we have a lot of dust in this area, and that will creep through a little bit, but, you know, that's not really a worry when you're watering outside. And then light-colored barrels, this fits, this is good, this is not too light, and it's also pretty thick. But if you get a white barrel, or maybe a really light color, it attracts mold growth, because the sun actually penetrates the plastic. And so you want a darker color, preferably, if you can get one. Okay, so, Elevating. We have, this is a really cool barrel because you have two spigots or two faucets. So technically, this should be able to water anything that you have. However, it's kind of hard to see, but if I have a, a pot or a plant that is higher than this, am I able to water that? No, right? Because I don't have any gravity flow. So that's one thing that's really important and why we need to elevate it because if you're trying to water any plants that are taller than your spigot, the water will not come out just because of that gravity flow. So anything below that, you're fine. And I've got some good examples of what that kind of looks like. Here's a great example. So this pot and this pot are, this one's quite a bit taller, but it looks like from this angle that this is <coughs> water both just because you've got that pressure, you've got that gravity flow. Now, if all else failed, you could just get um, a pitcher and you can hand water. That's totally fine. But you, you want to make sure you have some pressure in your system. There was a lady in Brownfield. We had a rainwater harvesting workshop there as well. She was excited. She, was, she couldn't wait to get home and get a rain barrel or rain chain installed. So she did, and a few weeks later it rained. It filled up automatically. Well, she called me at the office and said, Adeline, you know, my system, no water's coming out, but I know there's water in there, so what's wrong with it? I went over there, not like I'm an expert either, by the way, but I could tell there was something wrong, and especially when there's no water coming out. She had not elevated the barrel, so now it's full, it's sinking in the sand, and the spout is nearly in the dirt. 
So I don't really know how she got the water out of there, but you don't want that to happen to you. And you don't want that to be a problem. So just go ahead and elevate it. You can put it on some concrete blocks or even some more decorative type of rock if you have it. So that's, that's very critical. If you get nothing else, that's very important. And then how will you catch it? So there are a lot of different ways to, to catch it. We're going to hit two mostly tonight. So what, what kind of downspout are you, are you looking for? Do you want gutters on each side? Do you already have gutters on each side? Or do you just want to single side gutter it, direct that one waterfall in your, on your back patio? It really is your preference. And then we have something called rain chain. So in place of a gutter, you've got a rain chain. These are a little bit more aesthetic. This in particular is made of real copper, so it's going to get a really pretty patina over time, and it looks very appealing. But it's an extension from an already installed gutter, so we're going to see what that looks like a little better here. So, we've got here, this is a close-up. So they've got some kind of gutter, and then they have an extension where the PVC downspout would normally be. This one is, does not have a gutter, it looks like. Um, it's just kind of in the widow or the peak of the house. And the, this, this is a good description of, you can really just have any kind of regular chain. It doesn't need to be decorative. The water will bind to any chain that you, that you hang up. And this is probably the best example. And so you see that normally there would be a different kind of downspout there, but instead you put a rain chain and it's really aesthetic and it looks very nice. So we'll take a quick look at this. Rain chains are a beautiful yet functional alternative to gutter downspouts. Originating in Japan, rain chains have gained in popularity in the United States over the last 10 years. It's not raining, by the way. <laughs> it's not exactly realistic. Rain chains will gain a beautiful patina over time. Rain chains are also a great alternative as they encourage rainwater reclamation. In combination with the rain barrel to catch water runoff, Rainwater can be stored for other uses, such as watering the lawn or a garden. Rain chain sleep design makes a natural complement to virtually any home, traditional or contemporary. Okay, so now I think this guy makes it look really easy, but I'm a very visual person, and so I'm going to show you another video that kind of shows how he takes apart the original gutter downspout and puts in the rain chain. And he makes it look very easy. I hope that it really is easy for you. Bridge is long, bit like this looks perfect. And there's a scrub in that outlet and we pull back to it into the towel. So we need to see the next route. And we can cut these straps off or pull the nail this into the concrete. And then we just take our rain chain and this little piece of copper wire. And there's not one of these included with the rain chain, which body. I do one of these large ones in bed and shake. And then we look down it. Make sure you clean your gutters. <laughs> you should have probably done that. Well, 
Okay, so as I mentioned, he makes it look very easy, and uh, that's what it would look like if you installed it to some, a gutter you already had. Now I want to cover some do's and don'ts of rain barrel maintenance. We do want to plan out our design. I think we've, we've kind of made that clear with the location and what kind of barrel you're looking for. A first flush is very important. With these barrels, I would recommend um, flushing them out before the winter and storing them. I don't want to risk them cracking and freezing. And some people have had great experience. They leave them out all winter, no big deal. But I, I don't know. I feel like we should be proactive. And then clean out the gutters. I think that's also clear. That guy needed to do that before he shot the video, by the way. But um, that's also very important. You don't want all that jamming up the water that could be getting into your rain barrel. And then you want to use the water you collect. You want to make sure that you save it, you use it wisely, but that you also use it before the next season is over, or the next season is coming. Try not to let your barrel freeze. So like I said, I've had people say, oh, I leave it out all the time. I don't, I don't get anything. I, in fact, the snow fills it up when it snows. However, um, I'd rather not risk it. It is just plastic. And then an overflow plan. We'll go into more about that in a minute. But if you have a 50-gallon barrel and it fills up with a half inch of rain or less, you might need to figure out what you're going to do when that starts overflowing. Maybe where you want to direct it, where you want to send it after it's full. A rain garden is a great alternative for an overflow plan. It's a natural, well, it's actually, you have to make an artificial depression unless you already have one. But it's a very nice way to have something built into your landscape that looks natural. You have rain gardens that collect and recharge water. So the point of a rain garden is to slow the water flow down, control its path, and then also keep it in the ground or keep it in one place so that it will infiltrate into the ground. It's a great idea. We have this mentality that we have to build our landscape up like a muffin tin, except it's turned over. So we built it up and all of the water runs off of it. And Carmen's going to have some really great examples of that later, which is what you don't want. You want to keep the, the water in your land in the ground. So you need to turn the muffin tin over and have a depression catchment type landscape. This is a cross section, it's a little bit blurry, but you can see for the most part you have a drainage outlet, you have gravel to act as a filtration mechanism, then you've got the soil that you've dug up, you have your water storage, and you've got your drainage flow. You'll have plants in here that can survive without a lot of water, but can also survive with a lot of water when that time comes. And Carmen's going to also have some really great examples of the rain garden that we have in our office. Here are some nice examples. I really like this one. These creek bed rocks are very popular to have in a rain garden because, it, once again, it's, it's slowing that water down. The water's having to move through more objects, so it's not just flooding a, a particular area. I like to have this example because these plants are completely different from what we have here and what we would use here, but the concept is still the same, and it's adopted across the United States, apparently. Here we have an example in Austin. Does anyone have any idea why this would be cut, the curb cut, like that? Right, exactly. So they've, they've kind of come to an idea, and it's a good one. This, they do this in Arizona, in some cities. The water will run in here and collect in this rather than running down the storm drain and going to, I don't know, a reservoir or some other collection point. So this is really beneficial because it's getting all of these plants watered and preventing so much stormwater runoff. We should do this in Lubbock. We wouldn't, it wouldn't flood as much. A lot of times we get really stuck on just outdoor water for our rainwater that we collect. It is mostly for that purpose, but there are other uses too that I'd like you to consider. So we do have a livestock option. And these are usually larger supplemental type systems. But there's a couple that lives in Lockney, and they have eight 3,000 gallon tanks. They have a huge barn, I think it's 12,500 square feet. So they have a lot of capacity, and, and the man told me that he could even have more barrels. That's not enough, the eight 3,000 gallon tanks. Anyway, they water all of their horses. They have five horses, 
they don't have groundwater that they use, they don't have surface water. It's just collective rainwater and then it drains to their stock tank and fills that when needed. I love that. I think that's awesome. And they said they even ran about 100 head of cattle with that water for a week. Now, the cattle were just there temporarily and then they moved, moved them on to another pasture. But I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, sustainable. Wildlife. The rain gardens that we talked about can also serve as a wildlife refuge, especially if you live out in the country, which I know you might not want to attract wildlife to your home, but especially in the times of drought, those wildlife don't really have water that's available. And so if you had a rain garden, maybe there's potential to store that a little better, have some good, some good spots for them to kind of have an oasis. <coughs> Stormwater management. So trying to mitigate the waterfalls, the flooding, the erosion of your lawn, if that's, that's what's happening, or your flower beds. So if you catch, capture rainwater, it's going to prevent that stormwater from flooding or eroding your lawn. Fire protection. This is also an important one, and I'll, I'll tell you a story about that in a moment. That's one I did not think of originally, but those of us that live out in the country, it could be very pertinent to you if you had a little bit of water stored up and you could use that when you were in a dangerous time, such as wildfire season. In-home in use requires more treatment and it does require, I mean, require pump installation. You also have to have filters, so that gets a little costlier. But um, there are, I'll tell you this too in a minute, there's a man that lives completely off of rainwater in Menard, Texas. They get nine inches of rain a year, and everything that goes in that house is from the sky, from the rain. They don't have groundwater, they don't have surface water. So he's made me a believer, and Carmen will talk about him too. Okay, I'm originally from the Alpine area, the Big Bend part of Texas. Not a lot out there, especially when you have a wildfire that's crossing the entire landscape moving really fast. You don't have a lot of time to get that fire department out there. This is at the McDonald Observatory. After 2009, they figured they needed to collect some, some water, have some storage built up. So this is leading to their parking lot. Their whole parking lot has a natural slant to it because it's in a mountainous area. And they collect all the water running from the parking lot, goes into this tank. They fill this with tiny bits of rain. So really, they need to have probably four or five more tanks. They could have that potential to collect that. It's a really neat idea, and I think it's good if you live out in the country. There, these exist in Muleshoe. Did anyone know that? Okay, I learned that at one of our last rainwater harvesting workshops, and I'm fascinated by it. I'm gonna have to go see these. So what they've done is they have created this structure that acts as a roof surface. It collects in the tank, and then it essentially waters the, the wildlife. I think it's amazing. I, I'm going to have to go look at that after all of this is done. Um, this is Billy Niffin's house, the man in Menard. This is what his house looks like. It's very nice. It's out in the country. And he's solely on rainwater. So I think we can all do it if we really collected and, and conserved. Here's another example of a nice rain garden. These are larger rocks and some really nice landscaping. But your system can be as simple as this. If you just want to water one tree, you can do that. That is completely up to you, depending on what your needs are. This is a really neat little system. I would like to, to build something like that. But just a tiny little catchment area, gutter, whoop, downspout, tank, and then out. It's just so simple. All right, so to wrap this all up, I've covered a lot of information. But your rainwater harvesting system is all you. It's what you want, it's what you desire to have, it's your goals. How much do you want to catch and how do you want to catch it? That's exactly what you need to think about when you're developing this system. Now these are the barrels that you all will leave with tonight. And I think it's important to note that this has a planter in it. So that's really nice, it can be very aesthetic. The overflow plan that I mentioned earlier, it, it doesn't have an overflow outlet. So I would just say that you could do that with, with the two spouts. You could just put a hose on it and send it to your flower beds or send it to another area in the yard just to kind of prevent that from overflowing. But the beauty of this is it's all up to you. And you're the ultimate mastermind. Uh, we hope that 
this is a good start for you, but those of you who are already collecting, it'll just be an addition to what you already have, and we're very glad to see so many people already catching rain. I think that's, that's awesome. With that, do I have any questions? Um, any questions that you guys thought of between now and when I started? <laughs> no? Oh, man. I either did really great or I didn't do very well. Either way. I'll hand it over to Carmen now. He's going to cover the zero escape portion. So thank you so much. Now that you've collected all this water, what do we do with it? How do we use it efficiently? Well, we'll be talking about water smart landscapes. And, and one of the things that I really like is Turk's Cap. It's one of the uh, plants here shown on the right. It's very attractive. It does look like a Turk's Cap. And it comes in several varieties, a red variety, a white variety, and also a uh, pink variety. It doesn't take much water. You can pretty much uh, plant it and let it go. But I don't have to tell you that we live in a land of weather extremes. 2010, this was the double mountain fork of the Brazos River at Justiceburg. Water is right up to the edge of the bridge. A lot of the old timers said they had not seen that happen. Had some flooding in the Playa Lakes that are used as uh, city parks there in Lubbock. And then 2011 rolled along and we had the drought. This was October 17th of 2011, looking north from our street there in town. And I guess really that's the closest I would imagine the surface of Mars to be. I did not Photoshop that picture. That's just exactly how orange it was when that massive wall of dirt rolled through that day. Since 2011, we've learned that drought does take its toll on both surface and groundwater. As of today, our reservoirs in the state of Texas are 71.6% full. They were at 65% last year. We don't have any surface water reservoirs within the High Plains Water District, but these are the closest ones around. Lake Allen Henry is at 74.1% of capacity today. Lake McKenzie at 7.1%. Lake Meredith at 5.4%. And White River at 3.6%. And these were the totals last year. So we have had some rainfall. We have had some snow. And that has really helped our surface water. The High Plains District deals primarily with the Ogallala Aquifer. It's thought to be the largest aquifer by volume in the world, stretching all the way from South Dakota to the Permian Basin area down around Midland, Odessa. Our groundwater moves in this direction, down gradient, moves very slowly. And we really don't get much groundwater recharge from the rest of the aquifer. The thickest part is up in Nebraska, and we're out here on the feather edge of it, so we don't have much saturated thickness. But our district makes annual water level measurements in a network of about 1,400 privately owned water wells. And you can see by the slide how drought has impacted that. And when I say we make our measurements for a certain year, this example of 2012 actually reflects the previous year of 2011. So this would be 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. You can see here we had a decline of minus 2.56 feet. That was the third largest average annual decline in the district's history, going back to 1951. Uh, we've just made this information available. We had a decline in 2014 of 0.56 of a foot, average throughout our 16 counties. So again, having some rainfall has really helped out. I don't have to tell you that gardening can be a challenge in a semi-arid landscape. We have unpredictable rainfall, you can see here, 26.46 inches in 2010, and we rolled into 2011 and only had 5.86. Last year at this time, we had about 9 tenths of an inch. Right now, we're about 3.20. So we're all very thankful for that. We have a very high evaporation rate in this area because of heat and our wind, about 80 inches of, of evaporation per year. 
Again, the high gusty winds, as I just mentioned. Sometimes we have watering restrictions during the growing season due to drought. A lot of the seeds have different uh, drought contingency plans in various stages of water usage. Low humidity, and of course our temperature extremes. We've heard the word xeriscape, and it comes from the Greek word xeros, meaning dry landscape. And it was really coined back in the 1980s by the folks in the green industry in Denver, Colorado. Denver was under drought conditions at that time, and the folks who sold plant materials were very concerned about their livelihood. What do we do? So they came up with this idea of xeriscaping or dry landscaping. But I want you to take home tonight that xeriscaping is not zero scape. It doesn't have to be concrete or cactus. You can have a beautiful landscape that can be water efficient, it can be water smart, and it can be very colorful and very lush if you have the right types of plants. And xeriscaping is really common sense landscaping when you stop and think about it. Of course, as Adeline mentioned with the rainwater harvesting barrels, you need to think this out first. Proper planning and design is very important. Consider what you want your landscape to look like. What's the function? What do you want it to, to function as? Do you have a lot of resources for maintenance or do you want something that will be lower maintenance? What's your water requirements? How much water do you have to work with? And you can phase this in over time. It doesn't have to be something that's done immediately. Now, if your budget allows it, you can do this over several years. Soil amendments are important. You want your soils to retain water and then drain very quickly. Increasing organic material is important. And you want to make sure your soil is well aerated. And soil testing is also a good idea so you can determine the amount of nutrients in your soil. Plant selection is also very important. Select plants that are native to the region. There are some that are known as drought busters. And you want to select those plants that can survive with native natural rainfall so that you don't have to irrigate them all the time. Here's a list of plants provided by Dr. George Jury, who is the past president of the South Plains chapter of the Native Plant Society. And they're included in the handout of my presentation. But you can see there are a wide range of some of the plants that he recommends. Uh, anything from uh, Texas sage to uh, white bush or bee bush. Uh, Colon Easter here is a non native plant, but he says it's very pretty. You've got various daisies, here blue bonnets, and then your trees, your cedar elm that we use in our office. Chinese pistache, and your red oaks. Turf areas require the most water and most maintenance, obviously, but your water-efficient landscaping really doesn't have to be lawn-less, but rather less lawn. So let's say that you have a large yard, your kids are grown, you don't have any grandkids. Well, you might want to consider reducing that turf area by putting a deck in or putting in some other plant material, a hardscape perhaps, to reduce that turf area. Dr. Joey Young with Texas Tech has a number of water smart grasses. There's a handout on the back table listing some of those. Also, the pros and cons of artificial turf. But he has some of these grasses, of course, blue drama, which is pretty drought tolerant. Buffalo grasses, which are the native grasses. Bermuda grass, they have some varieties called Celebration and Discovery. Turfalo from Frontier Hybrids. Tech turf and Shadow turf are some good uh, varieties that he recommends. But irrigation is very important. You need to do that as efficiently as possible. You want to make sure that you avoid overwatering. You can see here, this is a photograph of the Science Spectrum Science Education Center in Lubbock. They have the drip irrigation tubing out here, and also some mulch, and they have the red hot pokers here in their landscape. You want to water deeply, 
and less often to develop a strong root system for your plants. If you have a shallow root system, they don't use water efficiently, they don't take up nutrients here as well. It's important to group your plants by, in your landscape according to your water needs. This is a picture of the Xeriscape demonstration garden out at Fox 34 in Lubbock. They've grouped all these plant materials according to their water needs. So they don't have a very high water use plant over here and then low water use plants over here. They require the same amount of water and that will be supplied by a drip irrigation system see here the purple heart and your various grasses. <coughs> but you want to make sure that you have your low water use plants away from the house so that they can rely on natural rainfall. Your medium plants would be providing a supplemental watering, say maybe once a week. And then your high water use plants would be closer to your landscape, to your house, so that you can use your rainwater harvesting barrel to provide additional moisture for them. This is also out at uh, Fox 34. They used a red mulch in front of this bed. It helps shade the soil, it reduces evaporation, it reduces weed growth, and it does provide decoration. That's a nice red color out there on the corner. Xeric landscapes do require some maintenance. I mean, I'll be very honest with you, you've got to keep them up, you just can't let them go. But they can help reduce maintenance by reduced mowing, once a year mulching. You can eliminate some of the weak, unadapted plants, and then you can also utilize more efficient irrigation practices. We're seeing more and more water efficient landscapes being put into uh, place in various towns throughout the water district. You can see, this is the New Market Street at 19th and Quaker in Lubbock. They have the cobblestone, the uh, distressed granite, and then also the water efficient plants there. This is a Walgreens. So we're seeing more and more businesses adopting that. And we've also done that at our office there at 30th and Q in Lubbock. We have a passive rainwater harvesting demonstration. And as Adeline mentioned, we want to make sure that we have depressions in our landscape to collect rainwater rather than allowing it to flow off. So this is a depression area. We have an employee parking lot right here. The water drains off of the parking lot and goes into this depression. And it keeps it from entering Avenue Q right here. And this is a cross section of that. You can see that this swale is in the middle here. And there are various grasses in the middle that can benefit from that moisture. This is looking north from our building. We have an area of distressed granite. We have some large blocks that are, once this is established, will be used as an outdoor classroom area. But this is the rain swale right there. There's some switchgrass in the middle and then western wheatgrass right here. Both are bordered by the cobblestone. We have red yucca in the foreground here. We also have some coral berry. And these are cedar elm trees. Again, you can see this would be the parking lot area. There would be an entrance right here for vehicles. This is the rain swale. This area is not shown in my pictures, but we're demonstrating rainwater harvesting through permeable parking areas. So this has the distressed granite there, so you can park on that, and rainwater would also be able to penetrate down through that material. The district has always promoted this slogan on, don't pray for rain unless you take care of what you get. This is a photograph of my home, and you can see the amount of water that was coming off the gutter before we put in rainwater harvesting barrels. And Adeline, you were talking about the waterfall at your home, and that's pretty much what we had there. The rainwater harvesting doesn't have to be high tech, it can be pretty low tech. Uh, these are some beverage bottles at uh, next door to my sister's house in Rio Dosa. That's why it says RT, she up on the air. And they've taken just the little snap-on nozzles that uh, you can buy and put that on these bottles, fill them with water, and she's, she's uh, watering her marigolds there and other plants. 
But lawn watering and other outdoor use can account for about 50 to 80 percent of the water use around the home during the summer. And unfortunately, we apply that water very inefficiently. You can see in the slide that we have a person irrigating this area, and the water is spraying up here on the sidewalk, probably getting a lot of evaporation and wind drift as a result. So a lot of that water that is being applied never reaches its intended target. Here's another great example of that. See all that water being sprayed up in the air and it's drifting back down here. You want to avoid sprinklers that spray water high into the air. You want to make sure your sprinkler system has proper maintenance so that you don't have a, a, a sprinkler head that's popped off like you're shown here. I'll share a little story with you. I have a friend who works for the city of Austin. And they received a report one day of a water violation very much like this. The head had broken off a sprinkler, and they went out there to investigate that to stop the waste. So they rolled up on this, and there's a young man out there in a pickup. He is vigorously washing that truck. And they asked him about it. He said, hey, hey guys, I didn't do this. He said, I saw that water, and I thought I'd use it wisely, so I'm washing my truck. I don't want to get in trouble, but yeah, I didn't do this. So they reassured him that it was okay, and they kind of said, well, that's a good idea to use that water wisely. But you want to make sure that uh, you don't use sprinklers that provide or produce a fine mist because of the wind, evaporation, and drift. A lot of times with our sprinkler controllers, it's set it and forget it. If you have an automatic sprinkler system, it's important to make sure that it's set correctly. And if you have, you're going into the winter season, sure, make sure that you have that turned off because you don't want that water going out there on the street, causing an icy patch, and then having accidents as a result of that. Don't overwater. You want to make sure that the water amounts don't exceed soil infiltration. This is what's happening here. Uh, water is being applied to this turf area. It's running off into the street here. So you can use timers to apply water for a specific amount of time. If you don't have a timer, if you're just using a hose-in sprinkler, you can let it run, say, for about 5-10 minutes, go out, turn it off, let it soak, let the water soak into the soil, turn it back on, and continue watering. About one and a half inches of water applied once a week will be good for most turf grasses and will keep them healthy. We all know not to water in the heat of the day because of evaporation and, and wind losses potentially. So late evening and early morning are great times to water your lawn. And make sure that you follow your local watering ordinances if you have those. Billy Hinton, there he is right there. Adeline had mentioned a little bit about him. He does live in Menard. He does not have any groundwater. He's too far out in the country for city water. All the water he uses in his home is rainwater. He filters it with a, a UV filter, ultraviolet light, and drinks the rainwater. So when he was going to build his house that you saw, he made a deal with his wife. She said, Billy, I want a jacuzzi bathtub. And he said, hun, that's great. You can do that, but you can only use it when the tanks are full. So let's fast forward a few years. Billy was at a workshop that the district sponsored over in Rawls. And that's where I took this photograph. He's making a rain barrel there. But he was in the middle of his presentation, and his cell phone went off. So he said, folks, excuse me, it's my wife. I've got to take this. So he kind of stepped to the side and he was gesturing and I could tell that he was giving directions. So a few minutes later he came back with a big grin on his face. He said, folks, it is pouring in Menard. He said, I just told my wife how to divert rainwater into tanks three, four, five, and six. So it's going to be a good night tonight in Menard because mama gets to use her bathroom. <laughs> This is also at, in Menard, this is the rainwater harvesting demonstration that Billy constructed at the city of Menard Library. This is the 
rainwater harvesting barrel that I have at my home. We've guttered so that the water will go down into this barrel. We have six there at our house. I'll tell you it's a work in progress. I'm still trying to work out some of the bugs, but it reduces some of the dependence on the city water. You know, I can use this for flower beds, and I can also help use it for my wife's African violets and orchids. So it's a good thing to do, and uh, again, you know, you never know, Adeline, you know, you might have a water outage or something like that, you need to flush your toilet, so you've got some water stored up for that. Here's a photo of some of the rain chains. Uh, this is at the American Cancer Society's Hope Lodge. The day I took this, it was kind of drizzly and misty. So you can see right here, there's a water drop right there on that uh, chain. So it can collect water very easily. And it goes down from the top here, this beam, to an area. I don't know if they have that hooked up to a cistern or not, but there are, is uh, some rock material right there in the basin. There's some resources that are in my handout. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, but there is some links to uh, Seriscaping in Colorado, in Albuquerque, Denver Water, and the Seriscape Council in Mexico. So I do want to give you a parting thought, and it is endorsed by Walter Drop. So, Adeline, if you'll start the video, I sure appreciate that. And while she's doing that, I'll make mention we do have a, a monthly newsletter that is available by email and also a print version. It's called Cross Section. And if you'd like to get on the mailing list for that, see us afterwards and we can either set you up with a print version or the email version. The email version goes out about every two weeks, and the uh, other print issue is monthly publication. And there's no charge for either one of them. Everyone loves a glass of water. But somehow we waste water every day. We pour it down the drain, and our world seems the same. But if you love something, you don't throw it away. H to the bow, I hate to see you go. Cause if you go for good, all life is gone as well. So everyone, say water like Saving life as well. Water isn't just a drink, it's used for other things. Like watering the farmers, crops, and helping all the grass here. But we must still make sure that none of it is wasted. So the fish are not without a home. H2O. Saving life as well. That little video was the audience choice winner in 2009 for the Rainbird Sprinklers Intelligent Use of Water video competition. So we're very thrilled to share that with you. Final thought, there's no substitute for water. We have substitutes for motor oil, sugar substitutes. We haven't come up with a substitute for water, so we want to conserve it today, preserve it for tomorrow. Here's my contact information. Uh, if you have any questions, Adeline and I will be glad to answer them. If not, we will distribute the rain barrels. Yes, sir. Just got one. 
Do you have to know how much or how far the aquifer has depleted since it was first started being measured? We think that about half of the aquifer has been depleted through, throughout time. You know, uh, irrigation in the area began in the 30s. Actually, back to the 20s, actually, because the, the first irrigation well that we know in this high plains area was drilled in the Plainview area in 1920 on the J.H. Slate farm. So we think about half of the aquifer has been depleted since then. Some areas, as a result of the saturated thickness, have already reached some depletion, or already depleted, that they're not getting any water. And it's just the way the geology was laid down throughout time. And we have some areas that are very thin, about 20 foot of saturated material to draw water from. Whereas you go into Nebraska, you have anywhere from 5 to 1,000 foot of saturated material to draw water from. It's just we're on the feather edge of the formation out here, and that's all we have to begin with. So throughout time, we have used the water, but we're understanding more and more about the aquifer system. We're understanding more about the Dockham aquifer, which is the brackish aquifer beneath the Ogallala. And we're looking at ways that we might be able to utilize that water in order to conserve the fresh water in the Ogallala and maybe extend that life of the aquifer. You spoke of that, that other aquifer that we built the dock. Yes, sir. What, per, what uses would that brackish water serve? You talking about for the fracking purposes and that type of thing? It could be used for oil field purposes, and it is now in some areas. For example, the cities of Hereford. Tulia and Happy have municipal wells into the dock. And it's of such good quality up there that they can pretty much use it for municipal purposes. But if you move south from that area, it becomes very brackish, even more brackish than seawater. So you may see in the future some smaller desalination plants be put in play to use uh, reverse osmosis to clean up that water so that it may be able to be used for livestock or even maybe some municipalities. Maybe the technology cost will come down to allow that. Uh, Adeline's going to El Paso tomorrow, as she mentioned, to some of you to pick up water samples for the Wolford Water Expo from the K. Bailey Hutchison desalination plant. And that uses reverse osmosis to purify the brackish groundwater. And that brackish groundwater was intruding into the freshwater aquifer there in El Paso. So they're using that. And kind of putting a barrier in place, so to speak. They're pumping out some of that brackish groundwater. That plant is the largest inland desalination plant in the world, and it can provide up to 25% of El Paso's annual water supply when it's at full capacity. So it's, it's a good use of that uh, uh, groundwater resource there. So we may see something like that in our future. Any other questions? Let's pass out some rain barrels and rain chains. Okay, so we have the cardboard boxes with the rain barrels in them along this wall. And we have rain chains that are in my vehicle. And so once we get our rain barrel in here, we can go out there and get the rain chain. Uh, we have two different kinds. I failed to mention this in my presentation, but this is one kind and then another one has more of the decorative cup type flower style. Anyway, um, all of the barrels in here are of this, this is what they're going to look like. They don't have the faucets on them, that's how they fit in the box. But, we keep an organized manner and um, just, they're not too heavy, they're just kind of bulky. So if you guys need help, we can... The faucets are with the barrel. They are in the barrel. They're not on the barrel. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're in the screen. There's a little plastic bag, and that's where you have those fittings. 